Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today, I would like to present my PhD research on bumblebees. But it's not bumblebees here in the UK, but the bumblebees in Southeast Asia. Bum in Southeast Asia, there are approximately 22 species of the bumblebees. Um, all, of this, all of them are on the high mountains with the, the, um, the weather is quite different from the ground. They are very hard to study of the bumblebee here because due to their habitat is on the high mountain and their morphologies. So in this tree picture of the bumblebees, there are all different species, but they show the same color pattern. So they mimic each other. As well as their fruit plants, we don't know anything like the basic information about their fruit plant, which plant that they visit. So it's very hard to study that um, about the pollination by the bumblebees in this region. So normally the fruit plant of the bumblebees is very easy to observe in like in UK. This is like the habitat that is really common for the bumblebees like the exposed area with the flower. So we can observe the, the flower that bumblebee visit. But in the um, Southeast Asia, in, on the high mountains like the tropical forest, so it's very hard to observe the flower like something like in the, on the canopies. So we don't know like the bumblebee visit flower on the canopy or not. So it's very hard to study the food plant of the bumblebees in the Southeast Asia. However, so it might be something that we can trace back the food plant of bumblebees. The example is like the pollen. So bumblebees collect the pollen grain from the flower because the pollen is the um, protein and lipid source of the bumblebees. So they collect the pollen from the flower and carry back using their hind leg and, store, and storage the pollen inside their nest for feeding their young bumblebee inside the nest. So this is like the pollen. So can we use the pollen to trace back their food plants? So first of all, um, I'm doing the field trip last summer to find the bumblebee nest uh, in Thailand, my country. So to collect the, the pollen that bumblebee store in their nest, however, no information about the bumblebee nest in Thailand before. So I have been surveyed in this, my study site maybe during last five years, but I have not spot any bumblebee nest. So the site study of, of my project is Doi in Tanun National Park in the north of Thailand. So there are about seven species of the bumblebee have been recorded. Here, so if you want to find the bumblebee in Thailand, so come to this national park. So I come with this time, I came with a different strategy to find the bumblebee nest. So I talk with the local people who might know more than us or more than me. Like, so I come out to Ban Me Kang Long village, which is on the, the, the mountain. And in this village, the local people is a different ethnic group for um, they call Korean group. So they have their own culture and their own language. So I don't understand their language, but I, they understand me. So they know, know Tha the, the central Thai language. Um, however, so I'm talking them, with them about the bumblebees. So in, in their language, so they have like the name of the bumblebees. So it means like the uh, bees on nightshade flowers, which is quite reflect the, um, the behavior of the bumblebee that usually we see the nightshade flower, like in this picture. So uh, the local people said to me that the bumblebee nest is very hard to find, so maybe they come in the, in the forest or something like that. But I told them like, I, if, the, if they found any bumblebee, so I will give like a little reward for to fighting the nest. So it's my, the, um, the, the great idea. However, like one hour later, so 
they called me that uh, they found the bumblebee nest in a rice field. So it's very unusual that bumblebee um, select the, that the light rice rice field as the nest. So we we come out like the the trip to the site. So the rice field that they have like. The local people found the bumblebee nest is quite far from the main road, so we need to walk around half an hour with like not quite accessible route, like in this picture. So we reached the right field that my um, they found the bumblebee. So it's quite like the mud, muddy paddles because this is the time of the year that the local people start to plant the the right the rice in that field. So the, the bumblebee nest is here. It's quite like a, a muddy place. So we found the nest of the bumblebees called Bombast Berise. Luckily, very near to the first nest. So we found another nest. So another nest is a different species. Um, is the Bombast Montevegas. So this one is uh, the first description of the bumblebee nest in Thailand. Moreover, um, those two bumblebee species are different in morphologies. So the Bombast Berwisset is a short-faced bumblebee, and the Bombast Montevegas is a long-faced bumblebee. <coughs> so we decided to excavate the, um, the nest in the following day. So we need to prepare like the protection suit and like to record everything, take a picture as much as I can. So I have like the team for, uh, in, in Thailand to help me to record everything. So this is like the examples of the excavation of the nest. So the nest is look like the, like the ball shape. So it's not too big, it's like the same size as the uh, common bumblebee nest in the UK. They cover with the, like the, the plant substrate and yeah. So we bring the bumblebee nest back to our station. So and try to record like take a picture and try to record like um, how many brood cells, how where is like they have any parasite on or something like that. So we, I will show like this is like the common bumblebee nest. So they have like any part like the brood cell here, the honey pot and the pollen pot and some egg here. So um, this this tooth is quite quite similar in shape and size. And so the thing that I need to know is like the pollen. So I. Um, collect the pollen and bring back to laboratory. So um, here, so this one is like the pollen. It looks like the, the, um, the green mass stored in the nest, and I'm trying to do to study the morphology of the pollen. So I sh I used the pollen acetolysis, which is common to study the pollen of the pollen morphologies. And then we um, prepare the slide and take some photos and try to identify the pollen using their morphology, like the shape, the pore, and the ornamentation on the pollen walls. This is very quite hard because I'm based like the entomo uh, I'm the entomologist and I try to do like the more like the botanist, so it's quite hard. So I try to do it like this. This picture is like the. The, um, the pollen from the nest. So there are all, like this, this small thing is pollen as well. So in this roughly, in this image is quite different in of composition of the pollen from the different species of the bumblebee nest. I try to uh, take the image of the different type of pollen. So this one, so they have quite Various type of the pollen from the Bombas Berwisset and Montevegas nest, and it's quite hard. So I try to use like the pictorial key and try to use the many books and try to identify. So I can identify and feel like the families of the plant. So this this is the one that I try to identify. 
and <coughs> for the name of the, the plant family, so I ha they have like the couple of the risk pleasure about the food plant of th those two species, but in China and in India. So they have like the same in the red um, family, but all of them are quite different in, ch in China and in India. However, among like the, the different shape of the pollen type, so they have like this chair food plant as well. So the thing that it might be explained that they um, visit the different, di different plant is like the, um, their morphology. So like I said before, like the Bombas Montivacus and Bombas Bericep is quite um, different in morphology. So this is like the, sh the short phase and long phase, so it's quite different. So they have some of the study before that show that um, the short phase prefer the cup shape of the flower, but the long phase prefer to like the tube shape of the flower. However, I'm trying to know like the species of the food plant that I, this, that this might support this um, observation. So the thing that I'm gonna do in my next step is to use the DNA to try to identify the pollen using the DNA. The, like the method called metabolic coding, which can um, extra, uh, extract the DNA from the mix uh, mixture of the samples and try to identify using the, the short fragment of DNA barcoding. So the conclusion is like, um, this is the first description of the bumblebee nest in Thailand. The different bees, bumblebees choose a different food. The pollen grain is very hard to identify in the specific level. And the last thing is the local people know more than us. So we used to encourage the people to do to do the research as well. And thank you very much for all the people here, and thank you very much for your attention. Hello, could everyone hear me? Great. Um, okay, thank you. Um, Today I'm gonna to talk to you about how museum collections could help save the Wallacean endemic ungulates. As you may have guessed, the ungulates that I'm talking about is these two guys. The, the top one, uh, we, called, uh, we call it Anoa, which literally means buffalo in Sulawesi native language. And the bottom one is Babirusa, which literally means big deer, or a pig that has deer-like antler, as you can see of the very elaborate test that protrude from the front dorsal of the animal. And these species are endemic to the Wallacean region, which is here. Um, so the Wallacean region is an area that is the meeting of two tectonic plates and it has a really unique geological history as it is formed by a lot of fragmented tectonic plates colliding each other like from millions of years ago. And naturalists have collected specimens from this place since the 1800 because there are teeming biodiversity here. Uh, and this is also the place where Alfred Russell Wallace, that guy over there, Actually, I'm really happy to be able to talk in the very same place where he presented his results on this area. And we are, uh, scientists believe that the teeming biodiversity that Wallace has found has something to do with the geological history or the climate has been that has been fluctuated in the very million years ago. And uh, currently, uh, the area is threatened by deforestation. So there is a plan to accelerate the infrastructure development in this area uh, in Indonesia, and there are around one million hectares forest gone in 10 years in this area in the, in the different patches all over the native habitat of these two species. And this size is around like 15 London city gone in 10 years. And uh, the Anoa and Babirusa 
really needs a lot of place for foraging as herbivores. They tend to forage in really large places. And they are also threatened by hunting by local people. This is the picture of the local snares that our uh, has found the Barbarusa in the forest. And this is the actually seasonal hunting of the Anoa that is always happening during the dry season. It's a tradition. It's a, it's a culture to hunt this species as the local subsistence. And because of that, uh, IUCN predicted they are declining. And there are currently around 100 or 1,000 individuals in the area. And we don't know how many exactly of Babirusa. And they predicted that depend on the density of the Anoa, that might not be more than 2,500 individuals. But when the Indonesian government released the report in 2018, there are only 500 individuals available for Babirusa in their monitoring sites, and even less for Anoa, even though they are monitoring more sites than the Babirusa. So the question here is that, will they go extinct with that amount of individual? Will they proceed, or will, if we do, try to conserve the species, could we really help them? Because the problem of small population is that they are prone to what we call the extinction vortex. So if you are existing in a small population, you don't have a lot of choice for mating. In the wild, animals tend to mate with their daughter, with their father, with their cousin, and this could reduce the genetic diversity to a really low level until you have a lost genetic variability in the population and further make the fitness getting even lower. With lower fitness, you've got lower reproduction and lower reproduction means lower population and the circle goes again until the species is extinct. And this has been observed in some of the vertebrates in the most uh, threatened areas. And in breeding is bad for all species, as you may have known from the Habsburg royals who has this protruding jaw that abnormally, uh, abnormally exists in the family because they tend to marry their own uh, family until it ends with the Charles V, if I'm not mistaken, when he could not have more son and they end there. And also happening in the lions that uh, the Viet, uh, it, this, is a, this is a lion that we found in the Vietnam. Um, there is an illegal breeding effort to support the demand of lion parts from the Chinese. And uh, although the cheetah looks fine, if actually the sperm are more, the, the more, uh, it, how could I, the morph. So the sperms are having two heads or the tails are gone or something like that, and they could not reproduce really fine. And when they do, usually their offspring has uh, re uh, deformed testiculars and lots of uh, disturbing images that I can show you, but that's not what I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you how could we detect that from the genomes. Um, Okay, it, it's apparently hanged somehow. Okay, so it's stuck. Okay, so really quick going to the, so imagine to uh, in an intergalactic family where the genetic diversity is really high, so you found, uh, to a person mating with each other, their son and daughter will have the genetic diversity of the father and the mother with a slight uh, variation due to recombination between the chromosomes, and the daughter will happen to be having the same thing. But uh, afterwards, uh, we expect them, of course, to mate with some other people and not between themselves, uh, and they may have a lot of genetic variation in their progeny. But even it, but it, when somehow there is an intergalactic war and the population of human going really low, uh, their progenies will somehow meet with each other and they will have uh, their progenies having the same amount of genetic diversity as their ancestors. And we could track the segment that is similar and found across the generation to track if there is inbreeding happening in the population or not. So the longer segments that are similar 
in the human population. Like the more, uh, the, the greater the extent of inbreeding that is currently happening in the population, and it means that population has recently re declined really quickly. And this is what I'm going to do with the ANOA. So uh, in the ANOA babirusa, we are currently sampling um, their tissues to extract their DNA and sequence their genome to detect these segments so that we could see through the generation if there are inbreeding happening or not. But genetic diversity change over time. There could be uh, adapta adaptation going on somewhere in the past and probably they also trying to adapt to certain environmental change like the recent earthquake that is happening in two years ago in the Palu where there is tsunami and there is a bottleneck happening with the population sometime in the past. And using this approach, we found that there is actually a bottleneck. But we don't know if it is, the bottleneck is happening a million years ago when the sea level is the lowest, or it's just happened recently because of the deforestation. So we could point point that there is a bottleneck using the genome data, but we don't know when exactly it happens. And the easiest is to sample the museum specimens. So we have museum specimens from naturalists that have collected them since 19th century, including here Wallace, and uh, we tried to sequence their DNA to know the baseline before the deforestation and after deforestation, if the genetic diversity between before deforestation and after deforestation is just the same, it means that the decline may happen far before the deforestation. And we could actually have this museum collection from all over museum in Europe, America, China, Indonesia, and even in the collect private collection if someone possibly have it. So I just found that there is a uh, Anoa skull in auction last year, 220 pounds. If someone have it somewhere here, feel free to tell me so we could sequence their genome. If we, were con if we could actually know the genetic history of the species, we could use this information to improve the conservation. As we know that species evolve through time, we could predict somehow in the future using how the genetic diversity related to the environmental suitability. We could predict uh, like in the 2018 or 2100 when the global climate change happening or may not happening, God forbid, and uh, we could prioritize which area of Sulawesi could conserve more genetic diversity than others because we don't have a lot of money currently for the conservation, we have to prioritize somehow. And genomic data could really help with prioritizing this efficiently so we could ensure the population is viable in the future. And here I want to close with how you can help. Um, no, not the getting me some taxidermy. Uh, if you have, I will be pleased, but if you don't, it's okay. But most importantly, report illegal wildlife trade. If you happen to see in eBay or probably in uh, online shop, there is an illegal wildlife trade. Please do report and support our museums because it's the vault, the time machine of our natural history. Support our zoos because they are also a form of conservation of the species and support our local NGOs. Here I'm gonna give a shout out to my friend who is working in Sulawesi, there is Tasi Koki. Alto and Yani, uh, most of them are in the northern Sulawesi, are currently trying to educate people about the conservation of Anoa and Babirusa and also helping with government uh, breeding uh, efforts to allow the species to again uh, rewild the Sulawesi area. And this project is a very large project, so I would like to acknowledge all the, all the institutes that has allowed this research to go on, the NERC, DCRF, DICE and the Queen Mary University of London and also Universitas Indonesia, the counterpart where we are working with and the Indonesian Ministry of Research. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone, I'm Meg. I am from the University of Reading. 
and I'm here to talk to you today about my research project on urban burial grounds as green spaces. There it is. Okay, so um, what I'll talk about today is, so I'll just briefly outline um, how I came up with the research project in the first place. Um, and the main research question I come up with to try and address the problem. I'll then go through what I did, what I found with what I did, what, uh, what I found meant, and what I'm going to be doing next. So the context for my project really is urban green spaces in this country. Um, so these can take on many different forms. They can be parks, gardens, play parks, wooded pit picnic areas, that sort of a thing, any vegetated area within a town or a city. And there's a lot of research going on into these kind of places with regards to their contributions to human well-being. Um, and that has led, as a consequence, to an increased focus on protecting them, enhancing them, and the general management of them has fallen mostly on local councils. Now, as part of my initial research, um, it was a surprise to me to see that Council management plans don't include burial grounds as green spaces. So why not, was my uh, first question. Um, and it didn't take much digging to see that there's actually very little ecological research out there on burial grounds. And what is there are mostly isolated single site studies, just mostly inventories of species that are in them. So there's very little evidence really to feed into any sort of management plan. And perhaps what I found that probably uh, still to this day kind of horrifies me is that 50 years after the last burial in a burial ground, developers can apply to completely exhume and reuse the site, which to me just goes to show just how potentially undervalued these places really are. So when looking at the scale of the problems that I'm talking about here, it would really be great if we had any idea at all how many burial grounds we're even talking about. We don't know how many there are in this country. We don't know the amount of acreage they cover. We don't know how many are split, how that is split between rural and urban areas. So that's all helpful. Um, so moving on to my research question then, it is based on this bottom statement here, that the foundation or building blocks of any green space is biodiversity, by which I mean the amount and the variety of organisms that are there. So anything from trees, fungi, up to birds and mammals. So here is my question then. What are the factors influencing biodiversity in urban burial grounds? And to answer that, first I would need to quantify biodiversity in some sort of meaningful way. And to do that, I set up one of the largest ecological projects on burial grounds that's ever been undertaken. And that sounds super grand and posh, but when there's not very much out there, it really didn't take too much to sort of get that title. So first things first, I chose beetles as a biodiversity indicator. So a biodiversity indicator is a species or a group of species that you can measure to generally characterize biodiversity in an area. It's not perfect by any means, but it does give you an idea of the status and the trends of biodiversity in an area. So beetles have been used for a long time as indicators in this way. I've just put up a couple of titles here um, of papers that have used them, but they mostly focus on ground-dwelling beetle families. And that's for several reasons, mostly because they are ubiquitous, so they are everywhere. They're really easy to catch. You just dig a hole in the ground and put a trap in, they blunder in, and there you go, you've got a sample. But when you're looking at burial grounds, there is a social and emotional, spiritual importance that we, hold, that we give to the physical ground in a burial ground. That's where our dead loved ones are lying, you know? So I didn't want to upset or offend anyone by disturbing the ground too much. So I decided to investigate whether flying beetles could be biodiversity indicators, like this ladybird here showing off its lovely wings. Um, but in order to do that, I needed to come up with a novel sampling method because it's not really been done before. So this is what I decided to do. I am modeling here the lovely pooter. God, that's a good name. Um, it's a tool that you use to hoover up. So I hoovered up any beetles within a two hour period per sample on either my white ground sheet on the right hand side here um, or on my vertically suspended sheet and that is just held up by some tent poles 
guy wrote in a couple of pegs. And the important thing here is at the end of a sample, I could take away all the equipment and all that would be left is a couple of peg holes left in the ground and a bit of trampled grass that could recover. So that was really good. So that's what I did and this is where I did it. So the red dots represent each of my sites. There are 20 of them uh, split between large urban areas um, across four different counties. So I did four samples, four two-hour samples per site uh, between April and September in 2018. And that's the period of the year when we generally know that insects are out and about, as it were. And this is what I found, my beetles. So um, altogether, I hoovered up nearly 900 individual beetles, and they fell into 24 taxonomic families. So I've listed on the right-hand side here the three top beetles that I found. Um, so... The knitted, the pollen beetles, top left-hand corner, a little black job up there, made up nearly half of the entire capture, followed by the flea beetles, which are chrysomenids, and they're on the top right-hand side there. I'm using this instead of pointing them. Um, and not so hot on their heels is the weevils, which is like this shiny fellow right in the middle there on 8%. So the remaining 21 families were represented by just a quarter of the entire catch, and I've put up just some of my favorite ones up here to show you. So, got my beetles. What I also did was create these site maps to show the surrounding urban landscape around each one. And I did that so that I could analyze whether the surrounding landscape, which, you know, they're dynamic, wildlife moves around, they're not static, they're they could potentially be important. And I wanted to see if the surrounding landscape affected my beetle abundance within the sites. So for the rest of my talk, I'm just gonna focus on three of the 20 sites. So top left-hand corner is Old Cemetery in Reading. So the sites are the dark gray bit in the middle. Um, and that had the highest surrounding area of man-made structures. So buildings, roads, pavements, things like that. And that's represented in gray. On the right-hand side at the top is Newtown Road in Newbury. And that had the highest surrounding area of domestic gardens and that's in dark green. And at the bottom here is Braywick in Maidenhead, and that had the highest surrounding area of public green space. And in fact, most of the area here, on this right-hand side here, is actually a national nature reserve. Okay, so we're going to focus just on abundance, beetle abundance. And by abundance, I mean just the total beetle count per site. So this top graph here shows that total beetle count for the three sites. So Braywick and Reading Old here have similarly low abundance, and Newtown Road, the right-hand side one, had over five times as many beetles captured in total. The bottom graph here is just summarizes what was on the maps a little bit better. So you can see here Braywick, oh no, hello. Spoiler alert. <laughs> So uh, Braywick here with the highest amount of green space, shown in green. Reading Old with the highest amount of man-made area, shown in grey. And Newtown Road with the highest amount of surrounding domestic garden. And they're directly under their abundances here for your reference. So the question at this point is, does this variation in urban landscape influence the difference between the abundances of beetles found? And you can use statistics to answer that question. My favorite thing in the world, not. Um, especially because the answer was no. <laughs> Great. So the nature of the surrounding landscapes in statistical terms did not st uh, significantly explain the differences in beetle abundance between the sites, which was fabulous. And I was so happy. So I thought, okay, let's look at some other factors that could be important. Age of the sites, nice range of them there. The size of the sites, and also the population size and density of the towns that they're in. No, no, and no. None of them. Wonderful. At which point I gave up and went to the pub. And then, when I could face it again, um, I thought, right, okay, maybe I need to focus a little bit more on what's going on inside the burial grounds themselves. So I decided to look at their management. So for each of my 20 sites, I allocated to four different uh, management categories, ranging from really intensive, lots of mowing, lots of pruning, not a whole lot of trees or anything like that, all the way down to least intensive, where basically they keep the paths clear, make sure the trees are safe, and that's about it. 
And this idea had legs. Legs, beetles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, because initial stats are showing that management type is having a, did have a significant effect on the variation in beetle abundance that I was finding. Hallelujah. Okay, so to put our three sites into this context, Braywick and Reading Old had the low abundances here, and they are at opposite ends of the management spectrum. Newtown Road, with the really high abundance, is in the wild category, and that was uh, made for sites that are at least partially managed for biodiversity, so areas of set aside, uh, wildflower sowing, things like that. So what does any of this mean in real terms? Well, it's showing that the way that we manage urban burial grounds is important for biodiversity, okay? Now, that's what it means, but in real terms, I think that that can have implications for local and national policy, because at the moment, there is no legislation whatsoever for the management of burial grounds. It is just left up to individual site managers, individual councils, and I think an important first step would be the official recognition of burial grounds as urban green spaces in their own right. So what is next for me is some more statistical disentangling here to really hone in on the impacts of different management methods on biodiversity. And I also want to build more of an understanding of what's going on ecologically in my sites. So that's going to involve more invertebrate sampling, some botanical surveying, and looking at soil qualities as well. So, thank you to you guys for listening, to my supervisors, Brian and Graham, and to Jonathan and Susan for making me go for this, because I'm really glad they did. So, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, and first... First of all, thank you for the Linnean Society for organizing this conference. Um, my talk today um, is on is flowering time and fencing in West, Western Greenland. It's based on the data I gathered over the summer. I got some funding from the Gatsby Foundation, and I've been continuing this project with my dissertation. Um, so, first of all, um, yeah, I've got this engraving here of Sir, Sir William um, Edward Perry's. Um, second expedition in the Arctic. He was one of the most uh, successful Arctic explorers looking for the Northwest Passage. Um, I put this here because most people think of ice and dramatic exploration when they think of the Arctic. Well, I certainly did. Um, and this is all what this talk is about. It's about a plan. But um, during my project, I got to handle some of Paris specimen, plant specimen that he collected during his expedition. Um, so yeah, just to give you briefly a um, brief overview of what I did um, and um, why um, change in flower time matters, what I did and what I'm going to do next. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, why phenology matters. Um, so phenology is critical for the structure and function of ecosystem. Uh, basically, if we're having phenology tracking, phenology is basically the timing of life events. It could be flowering time, but it could be also leafing out or leaf senescence. Um, and basically, phenology basically prescribes the length of the growing season. And it's not a uniform response um, across the globe, across even in one area between species. Um, there's a really interesting study here by Willis here uh, about uh, Henry David Toroswood, um, I'm sure some of you would have heard of Toro, he took meticulous records of not only phenology but also plant abundance and we were able to go back 150 years later and look at the species that were tracking climate change and the abundance of those species and the ones that did track climate change became more abundant. And so it helps to predict the distribution of species and communities, but also, um, yeah, predict the growing length of seasons. And um, to give you an idea of the mismatch that we have uh, in the Arctic in certain areas, like Kikajuk in northwestern Canada, 
Um, some species have been advancing by as many as nine days per decade. If you compare that to the UK, where we also have great, where we have better records going back decades, we have things like the Martian data set dating back to 1736. We can see that certain tree species have been changing by about a day per decade. Um, I'm giving you these figures to illustrate that we need several decades of records if we want to see if what we're seeing is just interannual change or actually an advancement in phenology. Um, so I focused on the Arctic because, as probably many of you know, the climate change is um, happening at twice the global rate, but we have very little records. And to echo some of the talks earlier today, the second speaker, um, I've been using um, natural history collections. And the region I focused on is um, southwest Greenland. This was um, one of the areas where we have some of the oldest records because it was on the way to discover the Northwest Passage. Um, so we have quite a lot of records from there. Um, and I knew from digitizing the botanics in Edinburgh that it was a big Arctic collection that was undigitized. So, um, so yeah, basically decided to unlock the data uh, in those um, herbarium specimens. Um, and I got, yeah, I looked at only one other pep paper used um, historical records to predict sensitivity of uh, land to climate change, Hanshin and Goryuk. So I knew it was feasible. And so this is a picture of the botanics in Edinburgh, some of the filing cabinet. It was quite a task. Um, and this is just to give you an idea. This was the oldest specimen I came across. It wasn't from the Arctic. It was from uh, the Herbarium du Bois at Oxford. But basically, if you're looking through on digitized specimens, um, there's a lot of surprises. But yeah, this one was from 1698. Um, and this one is like a typical example of the specimens you find from the expedition. This was from the Wimpers expedition. But as you can see, so this is the uh, Pesiculius flamia, uh, the big L flamingus. Um, you just have Greenland as a country and 1864 as a year. So sometimes with a bit of detective work, we were able to get more details, but um, what we were after was a big number of specimens, and sometimes um, we just couldn't get any further. So a lot of the really older specimens we were not able to use uh, in all model, modeling analysis. Um, so this is a brief overview of what I did. Um, so yeah, and the botanics that Edinburgh had digitized over 3,500, and um, I went then to Denmark, where they have an entire herbarium dedicated to Greenland specimens. So I was able to focus on 19 species um, to get a trend, to get a sufficient number of those 19 species. Um, to give you an idea of what I did, I took the taxonomic information, dates and location, and then scored them using this protocol that the curator at Edinburgh um, developed with other curators to standardize the scoring protocol. So to give you an example, so the one at the top here was flowering immature. This one here, flowering mature. And this one here, um, flowering old, fruiting mature. And this one here, fruiting mature. Uh, then for my analysis, I focused on the uh, flowering mature stage. That was the stage that we had the most. And for my 19 species that were complete, I run the analysis. Um, it was a Bayesian hierarchical model, random slope. So each species was able to vary random intercept random slope. Um, so just I'll give you a um, little idea where the graph is. So on the y-axis, <laughs> oh, <laughs> on the y-axis you have day of year. Um, so to give you an idea, uh, day 195 would be the 14th of July. And on the x-axis, you have the years. Um, so the species at the bottom that you can see the big trend. Yeah. Um, so the one at the bottom that you see the big trend is Saxifraga oppositifolia. And so this was an early flowering species, and you can see it's flowering a lot later. At the top here, the one here is uh, Linea borealis. That's the species that you've got at the top of the program. Uh, apparently, Linus's favorite species, uh, named after him. 
Um, so that was a late flowering species, and it's flowering um, earlier. So you can see the earlier flowering species are tending to flower later, and you get the reverse trend at the top. So um, yeah, and the red line that you can see here is um, my uh, model intercept and pretty much slope. Um, so all the time we found almost a slope of zero. Uh, the credibility interval was minus 0 0.1 going to 0 0.2. So it's pretty much centered on zero. Um, but yeah, so it looks like if we want to answer my question, originally is flowering time advancing in Greenland? The answer is no. But it looks like I should have been asking a different question. Is flowering time getting shorter in Greenland? Um, and why are we seeing this trend? Um, I'm, I don't know if you remember earlier, I mentioned in some parts of the Arctic, you're seeing an advancement by as many as nine days. You've got different snow patterns. So, yeah, I've been reading in the literature in around this area, in the European Arctic, there's been increased uh, snow precipitation and with um, snow melt coming later, basically the early flowering species are the most affected. Oops, there you go. The early flowering species are the most affected. Um, and with the warming, you're seeing the later flowering species flowering earlier. So, oops, there we go. Uh, what I'm gonna do next, um, this paper here um, used uh, field collected data alongside hair environment data to sort of see if you can validate those trends. Um, there's a lot of bias in hair environment collections. Um, and basically, we want to see if what we're seeing is really a trend or if it's not, it's not just a shifting baseline of people just going to collect specimen at a different time of year. Um, so I'm going to compare the data we have with field site Kangalusak in Western Greenland um, and see if we can compare the trends. And yes, um, see if I can validate the trends I have. Um, and yes, this is my further analysis. I'm also hoping to do some field work next summer to be able to collect some of my own data. Um, and to conclude, um, I hope I've um, managed to convince you we need um, several decades of data to be able to analyze trends. Uh, phenology is complex and there's several drivers. So to disentangle that, we need long time trends. Um, and yeah, digitization of the specimens we have is important. A lot of the specimens we have is still undigitized, um, but also continued collection and uh, detailed field work. Um, because a lot of the field work collect data of first flowering. And if you can imagine uh, Gaussian distribution, first flowering is just the beginning. We want to see basically if all life events, if they're happening earlier or later, if they have different drivers. Um, yes. So flowering time is not advancing in Southwest Greenland, but is it getting shorter? Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Louise. I am. Um, um, a student at the University of Reading, but I'm based at Naya VMR in Kent. Um, and I will be talking about my project focusing on Zalela Fastidiosa. And um, this project is um, funded by the AHDB, Agriculture and, no wait, Agricultural and Horticultural Development Board. There. <laughs> um, one. There you go. So I want to start off with a little story. Um, this is Cosimino De Luca. He, his family owns an olive grove in the south of Italy. And um, in 2013, he was one of the first people to notice the trees um, browning and withering. Um, and since then, he has lost over three, 800, different, uh, 800 trees that are over 700 years old. Um, and scientists found out that it was due to a bacterium. Um, and there is no cure for this disease. Um, all you can do is destroy the plant where it was found in, destroy all potential hosts, so all potential plants where it can live in, in a 100 meter radius. And there is 
um, a quarantine order of a five kilometer radius. So no plants can be moved out of that area. Um, so how, oh wait, no, not yet. Um, Zalela is famous. It is often in the news, actually. Um, you might have heard of it. Um, there is a big risk of the bacterium coming to the UK because um, it is found in over 350 different plants. And a lot of these plants are grown here. So for example, cherries, um, grapevines, um, la lavender, rosemary. Um, so it's good to keep track on where the bacterium is um, found at the moment. And recently, um, the Bridget Project, which is a huge um, consortium also focusing on this bacterium, and they made a little cartoon explaining the biology of it, and it was voiced over by Helen Mirren, so if you guys want to check it out sometime, um, it's actually really interesting. Um, so what is Xylella, actually? So it causes diseases in a lot of different plants. For example, um, a leaf scourge in coffee, um, it causes citrus variegated chlorosis in citrus. So um, uh, you have um, discoloration of leaves and you get much smaller uh, fruits. Um, it causes phony peach disease. So this tree is much smaller compared to this one. So it's like stunted growth, but it can also cause no diseases at all. So this is grapevine um, and the bacterium lives in, in, the, in the leaf but it just doesn't cause any diseases. And how is Xylella transferred to the different plants? So it is transported by um, insects. This one is a spittle bug. Um, it, the, the spittle bug feeds on z the xylem of the plant. So that's where um, the it's a vessel in the plant where the water flows through. Um, it picks uh, bacteria up that way and when it feeds on another plant, it can spit the bacteria out into that xylem. Um, and if you look, if you cut uh, a leaf, so if you cut the, mm, the xylem, so like this, if you cut this part um, and look at it under a microscope, this is what you would see. So these are all xylella bacteria um, and they cluster together um, they fo form a biofilm, so that's what it's called, um, and block the water from flowing through. So that's why you get those, uh, those symptoms. Um, and why is Xylella so bad in agricultural environments? So the problem with agricultural environments is um, you have a monoculture, uh, you have trees that are all genetically the same. So for a bacterium to attack, um, to thrive in, a, in, a, in an env environment like this, uh, it doesn't need much genetic change. So um, when it diversifies, it has a very specialized, it's very specialized, um, so it, it, um, it specialized in this environment. Um, but if you put uh, Xylella in a natural environment, it would have a lot of different hosts. So um, it wouldn't, if, if, if it's causing disease in one plant, um, it wouldn't necessarily cause disease in a plant right next to it. So that's why it's not as bad in natural environments as in um, uh, agriculture environments. So the bacteria has a, has a chance to diversify differently rather than just into one niche. Um, so how does this plant get to this plant? Um, so the bacteria, this is, uh, this is a bacteria. <laughs> um, and if you look, oops, sorry. If you look uh, at the DNA of the bacterium, um, they, uh, they, oh, they translate into proteins um, called effectors. And these effectors are um, basically what make the bacterium bad. So these effectors are secreted by the bacterium 
and um, they interact with a plant immune system. So it could, for example, um, cause that biofilm, so the clustering of the bacteria to happen, or um, it could um, produce enzymes that, um, that degrade uh, the, the plant. Um, so, oh yeah, so that's what happens. The uh, proteins, they interact with the, with the plant immune system, but if the plant immune system isn't equipped to fight against that protein, you get this. Um, so that brings me to what I do. Um, so when you think about scientists, mostly you see, you think about people in white coats in a lab, but actually, I'm at the computer most of the time. Um, I do a lot of um, a lot of analyses on the genome, um, and most of the time I look more like this because <laughs> it's very frustrating. <laughs> um, but one of the things I do um, is I try to understand the relationships between the different bacterial strains of Zellella. So. So this is a phylogeny, um, it's basically a family tree of um, xylella, but this way. Um, so what I'm interested in is I want to understand how, if there are specific proteins that xylella produces that causes diseases in the plants. So if you remember, it the bacterium doesn't cause disease in all of them. Um, in some, it causes the leaf scourge, in others, it just looks healthy. And I wanna find out if these proteins have some kind of a, a role, that, pl uh, that play a role in um, causing a disease or not. Um, so I look at these um, effectors um, and I try to understand if they, they are involved in um, plant immunity. So I have, I have, okay. Um, the way you find those effectors is you look at the genome of the, of the bacterium, um, you have a software and um, the software basically calculates if, if a protein is an effector or not and I have done that, but most of those proteins, the problem with genomes is most of those proteins are not um, annotated, so we don't actually know what they do. Um, so they're called hypothetical proteins, and I have over 3,000 different ones of them, um, and probably only half of them have an actual role in virulence, so in disease progression but I will have to look more into that because this is an ongoing project. Hopefully I'll have more uh, information by the end of this year. Um, but uh, my research, um, even though it's quite basic and fundamental and molecular, it can still help Cosimino, the farmer from before, um, from getting his trees back. So if we understand Zalala, um, biology properly, if we understand the evolution, the relationships between um, the protein and the bacterium and the plants, um, we could potentially uh, target those proteins and find a treatment instead of destroying everything. Um, so to summarize, uh, there is no cure for Zellala. Uh, all you can do is destroy everything and just not move any plant material. Um, more research is needed. So Zalella was actually one of the first plant pathogens to be sequenced in 2000, but as you can see, we still don't know much about it. Um, and all we can do is prevent it from entering um, the UK. Thank you very much. Hello, 
everybody. Um, my name is Steph Skip and I'm from the University of East London and I'm here today to talk to you about my PhD on saproxylic insects. So I'm going to begin by talking about a few of the concepts involved in, uh, in my study and then talk about the narrative that runs through my experiments. So to begin with, the fact, one of the most important things to say is to start with the most important concept in my PhD, which is the term saproxylic. Now, this refers to invertebrates that require decaying wood to complete their life cycle. So this can be in a number of different forms. Some insects live in dead wood their whole entire lives. Some of them just feed on other insects that live inside dead wood. Or some of them, like this click beetle pupae, just rely on the protective atmosphere of, a dead, of dead wood to protect them from outside fluctuations in temperature or weather. Now, there are a number of different habitats that um, saproxylic invertebrates use, use. So here's an ancient tree. And you can see it has a beautiful, lovely hollow in it, some peeling bark, and some lovely sap fronds. And due to the massive diversity of these habitats that you can find in ancient trees, there is also a massive diversity of invertebrates that use them. So in just the UK, there are over 1,700 species of invertebrate that use decaying wood. But unfortunately, these invertebrates are under threat. And that is because our UK woodlands are under threat as well. So that is in modern times through things like urban development and also in the past. For example, during the 1800s, during a wartime effort, there was a drive to collect wood for naval ships. And that meant that a number of trees of a certain age structure were felled. That means that nowadays, um, as our ancient trees begin to die and decay away, there aren't trees of the next age structure coming up, developing these habitats, providing a continuity across time for saproxylic invertebrates. And this could have some really major consequences. Saproxylic invertebrates play an important role in nutrient cycling. So taking the nutrients from a tree, um, working with fungi and microorganisms and breaking them down back into the soil. Also, having a vast diversity of insects inside a tree um, is really important in terms of you have a number of predators and these help to control lower species. And without these predators, some of these species might come up and become pests for forestry. So this leads me to my PhD. Um, I'm asking the question um, for the first part of my PhD, trying to find out exactly sort of how much habitat in an area is required to support invertebrates and um, how easily they're able, able to move between different patches of habitat. So I'm doing this through a schedule of trapping. You can see on the left here, that's one of my traps. It's a cross vein flight interception trap. And that's um, a passive type of trap, and it just works by the invertebrates will be flying around near to this saproxylic feature, which is this lovely split, and they'll bash into the panes of this trap and fall down into the funnel and be collected. I've put a number of these traps out into a couple of sites, which I'm just about to tell you. This is one of my lovely trees. So my two sites are both National Trust sites, which was lovely in terms of the tea and cakes that I was able to get. Um, Stowe and Wimpole National Trust sites, you can see where they are on this map. And all of the dots on these maps are um, trees that I've put traps into. So um, you can see some of them, for example, this number 17, are in quite dense woodland whereas other ones, um, such as these ones up here, can be right in the middle of a field surrounded by basically no other habitat. So I'm looking at the diversity found in all of these trees in these different situations and trying to find out whether there are different amounts of diversity in trees that are more densely surrounded by other habitat compared to trees that are a bit more isolated. My current progress is that I've collected all of my samples from my traps. I did that last year over the summer months and I'm currently identifying my species. I've identified over 50 species so far, and that's been really interesting for me, seeing lots of different species I've never seen before. And it's kind of been interesting on a national level. So this here is a weevil that I found called Acopora alternata, and it was the fourth location in Britain that it's ever been found. Um, it's, it's originally from Australia, so that was a really interesting sort of side find from my project. Um, but I do hope, I'm currently just looking at beetles because that's kind of my specialism but I do hope to expand onto looking at flies and wasps to incorporate a wider um, range of saproxylics. 
say, once we know um, around about the sort of threshold that, of habitat that we need, how can we help places that might be at risk of falling below that threshold? Um, one of the ways that we can do that at the moment is through processes called veteranization practices. Um, this guy on the left, he might look like he's causing some massive damage to this tree, but actually what he's doing is mimicking the natural process. So this might naturally occur when a lightning strike um, hits a tree, it causes a, a big split. And this is an area where fungi and bacteria can enter the tree and start to cause these decays that begin to develop these habitats. So you can see on the right here, there's quite a small tree. It's actually quite a young tree um, with a very small girth, but it does is beginning to develop some of the saproxylic features that invertebrates really love. Um, we, can, we call this a veteran tree rather than an ancient tree. But there are some, um, these features can take a really long time to develop, um, even through veteranization. And there are some habitats that might be difficult to replicate even through these methods. So this is the violet click beetle. It's one of the most endangered beetle species in the UK. It's only found in three sites. And it really loves a very specialist type of habitat. So this is a hollow right at the bottom of a tree, basically where the tree meets the soil. It's kind of an intermediate habitat between decaying wood and soil. Um, and I think it will be quite difficult to replicate these habitats through veteranization. So my project is looking at an alternative method of doing this. We're think, looking at in introducing the sort of wood mold that occurs between the soil and the wood in, into the habitat by putting them into boxes like this, which will be buried into the ground to replicate that type of basal habitat. So we've done this so far. Um, we've got 20 boxes on one site and 12 boxes on a different site just because uh, there was uh, slight difficulties in getting them in in one of the sites. Um, but these are both sites with active populations of the violet click beetle. So we've, we've already put them in. It's really, really great progress. So you can see one here on the left buried in there. We're filling them up with sawdust, sawdust, leaf litter and soil, which are the sort of components that will rot down to produce this lovely wood mould for beetles like the violet click beetle and other invertebrates to live inside. And we're going to be comparing the diversity of invertebrates that we find in these boxes after a certain period of time to the diversity that occurs in actual natural ancient tree basal hollows. Um, one of the things that we're studying about this is there has been some previous tri trials of um, boxes with wood mold inside them. These ones have been kind of like a bird box mounted up on the tree, mimicking a hollow that occurs um, high up on the tree. Um, these were made of wood, and one of the problems that they had was that they degraded over time. Um, the hollow habitats that they're mimicking can persist for hundreds of years, so it's really important that these habitats can last for at least a bit of time. So we are tr trialing some wood boxes, but in addition to that, we're trialing some plastic ones in the hope that they'll last a bit longer. And we've just recently developed a concrete box, which we're quite excited about. So that's one of the um, variations that we're testing. Another thing that we're looking at is sawdust type. Now, um, as wood, wood rots down, it usually becomes similar. So it doesn't really matter what species of tree it is. It usually holds the same sort of invertebrates down at the very rotted down level. So I don't think that having different sawdust types is going to have a big difference. But we are trialing two different types just to test this. Um, we're also adding a little bit of extra nutrients to some of the boxes, because in the wild, um, these hollows will be defecated into, and uh, invertebrates and um, organisms like birds will die, and things like that will add nutrients to the wood mold. Um, I could have put a lovely bird poo here, but <laughs> I know that we're just about to have lunch, so I didn't. <laughs> this is a um, pelleted um, manure mix that we're putting into some of the boxes to add, add a little bit of extra nutrients to see if that increases the diversity that's able to use the boxes. Um, the last thing that we hope to be looking at is fungal species. Um, a lot of saproxylic invertebrates rely on fungi very specifically, and some of the previous boxes, it's thought that they didn't have a certain portion of the invertebrates of an ancient tree because they were lacking some fungi species. So we're going to hopefully be testing the species that occur inside the boxes and comparing that to an ancient tree. And then in the future, if we do, if people do um, other boxes, they might be able to inoculate them with the missing fungi to add this element. So uh, thank you very much for listening to me talking about my project. Um, I'd like to thank my supervisors 
uh, University of East London and all my funders as well as a couple of other organisations that have been incredibly helpful for me during this project. Thank you for listening and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Thanks for staying after the free lunch. I'll be explaining the issues that we've got with invasive plants, and in particular, how to identify potentially invasive ornamental plants escaping our gardens. Uh, I am the third and final student from the University of Reading today, I think, so. Let's begin with a very simple explanation of what I mean by an invasive plant. So a plant or a species that has a detrimental ecological or economic impact. Now these are non-native species, by which I mean species that have been introduced intentionally or unintentionally by humans. And of course this presentation focuses on ornamental plants, and ornamental plants, horticulture has been the main pathway of non-native plants uh, to the British Isles and globally. Here we have an example, a giant rhubarb, Gunnera, which is invasive in parts of Ireland, grows up to 2.5 meters tall, and invasive species such as this, for example, outcompete native species for resources such as light. So that's one example. And I'll give you a few more examples as I go on. So how do ornamental plants in particular become invasive? This we can think of as a story. If we start here on the left, we have a Chinese windmill palm on the left, Tuchycarpus fortunii, which represents our gardens. Gardens are home to 78,000 plants, in the British Isles. The vast majority of these are actually confined to gardens. However, some will escape. They'll jump over the garden fence, if you wish. And here we have two examples, lamb's ear and water lettuce. Lamb's ear is a, a popular ornamental plant, Sacchus byzantina. Now these survive in the wild, in the British Isles, but they don't spread. Other examples, here we have Alcamilla mollis, ladies mantle, that does spread. It survives and spreads in the wild. Plants such as this we can turn naturalized. The big question for me is which of these naturalized plants or even the ones that are currently confined to gardens might become invasive in the future, for example, due to climate change. And I'll get back to climate change uh, towards the end of the talk. Let's have some perspective before I continue. Invasive plants are one of the main threats to biodiversity, both globally and here in the British Isles. But I want to give you some numbers. I've given you the figure of 78,000 plants growing in gardens in the UK. That comes from this uh, book here, which is published by the RHS annually. And this essential list of plants available for gardeners in the British Isles. 78,000 doesn't fit on the slide, so let, pl let's play with the figure of 17,000. 17,000 species of ornamental plants. That compares to our native flora in the dark green circle on the left. And I've introduced the term naturalized. Those species that survive and spread in the wild represented there in the lighter green circle. The critical point here is that small red circle which represents our invasive plants that we have here in the British Isles. And the main point being here, yes, they can be very bad for biodiversity, but it's a relatively small number of species that become invasive. We have another example there, the Caffio lily, Caprobotus edulis, which is invasive on the coast, especially on the west coast. So, Given all of these ornamental plants we already have growing in gardens, obviously gardeners are crucial in trying to uh, solve this problem and identify potentially invasive species. So for this reason, I engage with gardeners across the British Isles with a simple online survey fo focusing on one seemingly simple question of which ornamental plants are taking over or invading their own gardens. On the premise that uh, if a plant is behaving in a, or has invasive characteristics in the garden, if it behaves in the same way in the wild, it could then be a problem. It's not an exact match, but it's worth investigating. The survey also had questions on how gardeners manage these plants, for example. So the survey gave me a list of plants that I need to investigate. 
uh, here you can see the distribution of responses throughout the British Isles. Approximately 820 gardeners completed the survey. There are also responses from Northern Ireland and the Republic, uh, although I haven't yet geocoded those results. And I'll just give you the top three from the survey today. The top one, Japanese anemone, very popular ornamental plant. Second one, I've already introduced, Alcamilla mollis, ladies' mantle, which is naturalized in the British Isles. And then thirdly, we have Mambrisha. Now, due to pure luck and, and nothing else, these represent that storyline very nicely. The Japanese anemone is found in the wild, it survives, but it does not spread, at least not much. The ladies' mantle, we already know, is naturalized. The Mambrisha is yet another example of an invasive species, especially in certain parts, North Wales, where I'm home, uh, from, is invasive in hedgerows and so on. So those three species represent the storyline quite nicely. An opportunity to publicize the survey, but also explain the issue of invasive ornamental plants, much as I'm doing to, with you today, was the RHS Chelsea Flower Show, arguably the most important flower show globally, or at least the most well-known. Um, here you can see a photo of the exhibit we had at Chelsea. People engaging with the interpretation material, explaining different aspects of this problem. Also leaflets. Uh, we shared 2,500 leaflets so that visitors could follow up and read uh, further material if they wanted to. Now I'll show you a very short clip so you can get a better perspective on the exhibit. You'll see the wooden structure, that's inspired by the giant rubber, which I introduced on the second slide. And then underneath you have a combination of plants that gardeners have reported to me through the survey. Some of the plants are invasive, some are not. And each plant had an explanation on its status in the wild. And obviously the clip is courtesy of uh, BBC South. So, as I said, it was an opportunity to publicize the research and also the issue of invasive plants. It was also a very steep learning curve for me in terms of effective science communication. This is an article in the Daily Mail, and uh, as I say, a learning curve for me in terms of how to convey a complicated message effectively, and on this front, I did fail uh, miserably. <laughs> um, but as I say, the whole point of a PhD is to learn, so there we are. Another question I asked gardeners was, how would you define an invasive plant? I've given you my understanding at the very beginning, but it's crucial to understand how gardeners might define the term. Not only now how I interpret the results from the survey, but also how gardeners interpret legislation on the issue. Uh, here we have a very simple word cloud uh, from, the, from the answers, and you can see some of the important words coming up. Non-native, takes over, spreads, Along the trunk, we have unwanted, which brings in the subjectivity. That's very important when we're looking at potentially invasive species, and that's uh, an avenue of research I'm very interested in. Again, when it comes to subjectivity, a good example of an invasive species here is the butterfly bush, Butlia davidii. It can be very invasive, yet on the other hand, as the common name suggests, very good for pollinators, perhaps. So it's not always a neat black and white argument between invasive and non-invasive. I'll ask you a very quick question here now. Show of hands if you think the snowdrop, Galanthus nivalis, is native compared to cyclamen heterofolium. Hands up for snowdrop. Hands up for cyclamen. Okay, uncertainty, which is good. That's what I was looking for. Take question. Oh. Both are non-native, and both are actually introduced in the same decade. My point here being, again, going back to the subjectivity of the matter, even though both of these are non-native and introduced within a few years of each other, they're both naturalized, but they're both regarded in very, very different ways. Uh, Galanthus navalis does not, for example, pretty much regarded as part of the British flora compared to a cyclamen heterofolium, which is obviously an ornamental plant. And that's again an avenue of research I find very interesting. So I've 
use the word climate change only once so far at the very beginning. And this storyline I introduced on the second slide is in the context of a changing climate that's uh, uh, not a, a challenge. Climate change on an optimistic front, I am a gardener after all, does give us opportunity to grow plants that perhaps so far we've struggled with. So that means we've got a continued introduction of new species in, into the British Isles. That continued introduction means that a lot of these ornamental plants have been grown for the north and the native range, arguably giving them a head start, but particularly if we're looking at Mediterranean plants, for example. And climate change will facilitate plants going, going along that storyline, going from the garden, potentially escaping the fence, and potentially be, becoming invasive. Here we have the graphic from Professor Ed Hawkins at the University of Reading, showing annual global temperatures between 1850 and 2018. So in terms of climate change impacts, I'll give you one example of a plant that came up in the survey. Here we have Rutinia codata, the chameleon plant. Most of you, if if you're gardeners, will be familiar with the variegated form in the photo at the top. Very common ornamental plant, but it does prefer damper ground, often planted at the side of ponds or streams, for example. First recorded in the wild in 1992. It's naturalized, but not with limited distribution, so I would sort of put it there in terms of the storyline. So how might climate change impact this plant, and will it shift to the right? For this, we can use a method called species distribution modeling. And I haven't included a slide explaining the method because in principle it's quite simple. It finds a relationship between current distribution and climate, and you can then use that relationship with climate projections to project uh, areas that are climatically suitable for the plant in the future. So on the left, we have the current situation, and on the right, projections for 2070. It's a scale, and the green areas show areas that are most climatically suitable for Houtinia Kadata. There are many climatic variables involved, of course, but if we consider the uh, requirements of the plants, perhaps much of England by 2070 become too dry. General climate projections are for drier conditions, especially in the summer, compared to the northwest of Scotland, where we might expect milder, wetter conditions, especially in the winter. So, this method of species distribution modeling helps us understand the geographic areas to look at with particular species. That method, however, does not help us measure invasive potential. It, measures, it helps us understand how plants might naturalize and move, but in terms of measuring invasive potential, that's a huge challenge, and I'm not the only one looking at this, obviously. Here, I thought it was appropriate to uh, Called Darwin very quickly, why this species and not another can be naturalized in the current country. And perhaps that's the critical point here. A different approach is to look at plant traits or characteristics. So when I was explaining the survey, a gardener might observe a plant showing invasive behavior. This is essentially what the focus on plant traits also does. Is there a combination of traits that can help us measure that invasive potential? And this is work I'm currently working on now, so I have no answer for you. Uh, but Japanese knotweed, we all know as an invasive species here in the UK, perhaps more of an economic impact than ecological. But we also have uh, the Chinese windmill palm, which uh, was on, on the second slide. Chinese windmill palm is mostly confined to gardens in the British Isles at the moment, but it's invasive elsewhere in the world. So the challenge is finding uh, as I say, a combination of traits potentially that could help us answer the question. So, by starting with that huge uh, list of 78,000 species, combining the different methods, the online survey, the species distribution modeling, and the plant traits research, hopefully I'll be able to come up with a short list of plants from the survey that we need to look at very carefully. And that then could feed into policy potentially banning a plant, but that's by far not the only uh, approach you can take. Softer approaches such as public awareness, such as the work at Chelsea, uh, are also very important. So to conclude very quickly, I am partly sponsored by the RHS, so I don't want you to go home thinking that all ornamental plants are bad. 
it's a relatively small number that are invasive. And in fact, uh, I have that circular diagram again there. Those plants that fall in, in the gray circle, a high number, a high proportion of those actually provide ecosystem services supporting uh, pollinators, for example. But gardens can help us identify the ones that have invasive potential. And my last point would be, don't stop gardening. It's, it, 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 despite what the Daily Mail says, it's not a, a scare story. Um, there's much to be enjoyed in the garden. Thank you very much. Any questions? So hopefully we're ending the day on a bit of a lighter note. So I'm here talking about my PhD project. I'm now in my second year of my PhD. And my PhD is looking at trying to understand slugs and snails in British gardens a little bit better. So I'm um, doing my PhD through Newcastle University, but I'm actually working for the Royal Horticultural Society and I'm based there at RHS Wisley with them. So you might be wondering, why is a gardening charity interested in slugs and snails? What's in it for us? You know, we usually are out there trying to destroy them, not understand them. And part of the problem we have is we're a membership-based charity, so anyone can ask us any gardening question if they're a member, and we will respond to them. And throughout time, we've noticed that a high proportion of the questions are usually slug or snail related. So throughout the past 20 years or so particularly, we've noticed that they've always been a high priority for gardeners. The issue we have is we usually get something like this. So we've got a picture of a plant that's been eaten. We can tell you that that is a slug or snail damage, but we cannot tell you which species is responsible for that. In this day and age where we're so worried about biodiversity decline, we're worried about inappropriate use of control methods, so things like um, molluscicides, it's really important for us to actually understand this a little bit better, to understand what species is causing that, and make sure that gardeners understand that there's more species of slug in the garden than the ones that actually eat your plants. An additional challenge we have is the slug fauna of the UK historically has been quite poorly understood. So in 2014, um, a group of people from the National Museum of Wales and also Cardiff University came together and they were trying to create a new identification guide for slugs in Britain and Ireland. In the process of doing that, they actually metabarcoded all of them as well. They discovered that we had 20% more species established in Britain than we'd realised before. So instantly this is creating a big problem for us because suddenly we have 20% more species than we thought. Many of these species also are arriving fairly recently and a lot also seem to be changing in range and very little that is known about those species that are arriving. Um, we can kind of figure out what, what country they originate from, but often in those countries themselves they've been very poorly studied so we don't actually understand much about their, di uh, their diet or their ecology. So we now know there's over 40 species of slug in the UK. But the good news is only nine of these are considered serious plant pests. There are a large number that are omnivorous, meaning they'll pre eat pretty much everything. So they can be minor pests because they will attack living plant material. But alongside that, they're also feeding on things like dead animals, fungi, lichen, algae, mold. So they're actually helping recycle nutrients and break things down. So they could potentially be beneficial. You've also got a specialized group at the bottom here these live below the ground, and they feed exclusively on earthworms. So slugs are actually quite varied. However, not a lot of gardeners realize this. Another challenge we have, gardens as a habitat, they're so variable. They can be paved, they can be lawn, they can be any type of man-made artificial habitat, but we classify it as a garden. Also, they're private property. So sending me out to every garden in the UK to collect slugs isn't going to be easy which is why we decided to use citizen science. This is where we ask everyone to take part as a scientist in my project. So we give them the, the information, the tools they need, and then ask them to send in the data. So the RHS is in a really good place for that. We've just got under half a million, well, we've just got over half a million members now, actually. And also a huge amount of visitors to the garden and also lots of staff and volunteers that we can reach out to and get involved, as well as the wider public. However, the problem we have is when you talk to gardeners about slugs, the two things that usually come up is, they eat all my plants, I hate them, how can I get rid of them? 
So this got me thinking, how can we answer a useful scientific question, but also influence gardeners to think a bit more positively about slugs in general? And this is where I came up with the Cellar Slug Survey. This is a pilot project I'm running at the moment um, to see how good citizen science can be for collecting data on slugs. Um, I have launched a wider project, which I'll hopefully get to mention at the end. So this asked people to go out and look for these two species of slug, the cellar slugs. What's interesting about these is this one on the left here has been here since at least 1600. There's a bit of debate as to whether it is native or not. Um, and it's known as the yellow cellar slug. However, in recent years, uh, people who record slugs have noticed that this species seems to have gone in de into decline. In fact, when they did that guide in 2014, they could only find reliable specimens from this yellow area here. They couldn't find them anywhere else in the UK. So they're a little bit concerned as to what is happening to this species. Meanwhile, what has happened is in the late 1970s, this species suddenly appeared, and we recognized it as a separate species. They look kind of similar, but they are different. This is the green cellar slug. Um, it's originally thought to be from the Ukraine area, and it's arrived and seems to be spreading and replacing our native or potentially native species. What's also really useful about these species is, although they're quite similar looking, they also look similar to the native, uh, native leopard slug at the bottom here. You can tell them apart because they've got this green, yellow mottle pattern, bluish tentacles, and the yellow species has this unbroken yellow line running along the center of the tail, which means we can identify it from photographs, which is really useful for citizen science. They're also all helpful to gardeners because they don't feed on live plant material, as far as we know. They only feed on decaying material or things like fungi, lichen, and algae. So they're a really good flagship slug to get out there and getting gardeners to think about slugs in a nice way. So we've been collecting data using iRecord, which is an established biological recording platform. What's great about this is I can actually share my data openly with the Conchological Society of Britain, who have a national data set that's been going back many, many years. Um, and also use their data as well. But it also allows me to have some flexibility in collecting a lot of special information that wouldn't usually be included. So things like how big is their garden? What kind of controls are they using in their garden? This is partly because it's also important to understand if that's influencing the presence of these slugs or not. But it allows me to assess how keen people are to go out and spend a lot of time looking about, at slugs and actually telling me more about their garden as well. So a huge amount of my project so far has actually been just going out and talking to the public, and getting them on site. So I'm in a really good place with the RHS because they have these flower shows um, throughout the country. So last year I managed to go to many shows and many other events outside of the RHS and speak to over 135,000 people about slugs. Generally these conversations start, ugh, they're disgusting, I hate them, <laughs> like, or they don't even want to talk about them, and ends with, oh, that's really interesting, I'll go and look at them in a different way. And that was exactly what I was trying to achieve, so that's really positive. We also had our two giant slugs commissioned, one of which is here visiting today. Um, we've been encouraging people to get involved through social media by taking their slug selfie. Um, we actually do have one of each species as well, so you can compare the two, which is good fun. Uh, everyone's got on board with that, including our director of science here wearing it as a hat. So that's been really good. The response so far has been really positive. Um, as of January, we had 262 records through iRecord. Um, of which 233 could be accepted, which means we accepted them as being accurate. However, 29 of these have had to be rejected or marked as plausible due to incomplete data. And this is usually due to things like lack of a photograph. And I'll come on to why that is so important in a moment. So the data so far is showing what we suspected. The green cellar slug is much more frequently encountered and recorded than the yellow species and seems to be much more widespread. So over 80% of records are currently a green cellar slug. And just a very small proportion are definitely the yellow species. However, what I've also found quite interesting is this 8% here. So the form we're using is limited to the three species we're asking people to look for. So there's two cellar slugs, the leopard slug, as it's often encountered with them or often can be seen. And it's nice for someone to actually have that to record as well. But this 8% is species that are none of those three. So we've been able to see that people are submitting incorrect records, and we're able to then verify them and correct them. So this has also provided lots of interesting data on 
um, where the people are making mistakes. Some of them are quite understandable. So, for example, we've had seven records of this species here, and, and, and the Galimax species. There's two species in the UK. They're very hard to separate. You have to dissect them to look at the shape of the genitalia to do that. This is a shame because they're actually both non-native species. Um, first of all, they arrived in the greenhouses around 1920s, and then around the 1950s, they decided, hey, the British climate isn't that bad, and they've actually established outdoors now. The problem we have, even for people who know what they're looking at, so for experts, um, is that the juveniles of the leopard slug and the species can look quite similar. So it's therefore not surprising that we've been getting records of these as leopard slugs. However, we also had some interesting ones. So, for example, we've had quite a few records as yellow cellar slugs, which are actually um, these large Aryan species, which are an entirely different family of slugs. And usually you can tell them apart quite simply because they have this big mucus pore at the back here, which often has a plug of mucus or some mud stuck to it when they're crawling around. However, you will notice that all these photos are yellow and they all have blue tentacles. So they've kind of got the idea, they just haven't fully grasp that this isn't the right species. And that shows why it is so, so important for us to actually have those photographs and why we're just not accepting any records that don't have those pictures, because in cases like that, those people thought they were correct, but they weren't necessarily. So this is very much an ongoing survey, but I'm just going to present a little bit of what we have so far in terms of data. So historically, this is the known distribution from the MEN atlas of the yellow cellar slug. So this is records all the way through until last year, not including my own data. However, when you look at our data, the sites are incredibly limited. Um, there's no obvious trend at the moment, but we seem to have good population around maybe London area. Um, unsurprisingly, they are in this Cardiff, Bristol area, because that's where they were finding them before, and also a couple of northern records, which is quite useful. So it does indeed seem to be become increasingly restricted in its range. When you look at the green cellar slug, so this is its known distribution. Again, looking at all data um, and up until last year. And when you look at our data, it's showing that it is, yeah, it's pretty widespread. It's pretty much everywhere they knew it was before. But what is also quite interesting is we have this record up here from the Outer Hebrides. This is the first record for that island ever of this species. So it's reaching places it wasn't that before. So this, like I mentioned, this is a bit of a pilot study to see how accurate gardeners are at identifying slugs, but also um, it does tell us some useful information. So you might have heard in the media recently that we started recruiting for the next phase of my project where we're looking for 60 keen volunteers to go out in their garden, follow methodology, I'll give them all the equipment and tools and training they need um, to look at all the species they find during that time. Alongside that, I'm also doing some feeding choice experiments, trying to actually identify these different feeding preferences and choice to actually evidence whether species are pests or not for gardeners themselves. So there's a lot to discover about slugs. They're a really interesting group to work on. Um, and they're also very controversial, which I quite enjoy talking to gardeners about. So thank you very much for listening. Um, if you do want to get involved, I have a leaflet here, so you're welcome to take part as well, or just come talk to me at the end. And any questions? Hi, um, we're going to continue with the day. Um, I hope you've been enjoying it so far. I know I have. It's been a fascinating day of talks and all the posters, um, learning all about exciting natural history research that is currently going on. So while Joe is busy tallying up the results, I have the great pleasure of introducing last year's student conference winner, Alex McGoran, to give our plenary talk. So Alex is a PhD student within the London Natural Environment Research Council's Doctoral Training Partnership. In her research project, she investigates the movement of plastic up the food web using the Thames Estuary as a model system. So let's give a warm welcome to Alex, who will be discussing what's on the menu. So before I start, I'd like to, uh, sort of a forewarning, I am recovering from a cold, so if I have to stop to cough for a bit, um, I'm, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> 
So I thought I'd start with a quote from David Attenborough. He's been very vocal on the topic of plastic pollution, and I think this quote sort of really sums up his strong opinion, but also how impactful plastic is. Um, so he said, in the it's the beginning. People of all parts of society are aware of what's happening. It's vile, it's horrid, and it's something we're clearly inflicting on the natural world, having a dreadful effect, and there's something we can do about it. <coughs> We still need to know how to dispose of this wretched material. Surely if we, if we invent it, somebody out there can deal with it, to deal with these mountains of appalling material. And the reason I quite like this quote is not only does it say, yes, it's a big problem, but there's something we can do about it. People are aware of it, and it's like we've called the sort of David Attenborough effect. Ever since Blue Planet, awareness and change for plastic pollution has been an ever-growing sort of support so I wanted to start with a slightly more positive note and hopefully end on a slightly more positive note because otherwise this talk is quite depressing. Because of the awareness, the downside is we've all seen images like these. So this is uh, often megafauna entangled or starving because they've eaten too much plastic. It's a very dramatic image we've seen. Um, here we've got an albatross chick that is starved because it's eaten a whole range of plastics from bottle tops to lighters. And plastics is a global problem. It is something that we're producing on every country, practically. Every person is contributing to this, this issue. And it's found in all of the world's oceans. In the surface water alone, there's hundreds of thousands of tons of plastic. And this is literally scratching the surface. It is the surface of the ocean, not midwater, not bottom of the uh, oceans, not rivers or land or in the air. I mean, Plastics have been recovered from the deepest part of the ocean, in the Mariana Trench, for example. And 60 to 80% of the litter we find in oceans is plastic. So by far, it is one of the biggest uh, contaminants. Some of the reasons the ocean gets all the credit for plastic pollution is these garbage patches, these gyres, where water currents accumulate vast quantities of plastic, these thick soups, plastic as far as the eye can see, and because of these and the impact they have on megafauna, the ocean gets a really sort of big uh, response when it comes to plastic pollution and plastic monitoring. But in fact, 80% of the plastic that we see in the ocean started its life on land. And it doesn't just get there. It comes from uh, cities, it comes via rivers and estuaries, and therefore these are really important systems to monitor and something that we want to address at Natural History Museum and why we have focused on the Thames. We know that the Thames is polluted. A study published in 2014 by my supervisors found that in just three months of sampling with stationary benthic nets, nearly 8,500 items of plastic litter were recovered, mostly coffee cups, carrier bags, food packaging, cigarette wrappers, both the clear cellophane and the sort of coloured card, plasticised card, as well as sanitary products, things that are flushed down the toilet that shouldn't be. <coughs> And it's not gone, it's not a problem that you know, was reported in 2014 and we've cleaned up the river. We still find plastic in the nets that we use today. We still, pretty much every trawl will bring up at least one piece of plastic. So if you stacked all of the items I found in one year and sort of raised it up, it'd be 70% the height of the Palace of Westminster Bell Tower, so 70% the height of Big Ben. And there'd be more items in that tower than there were steps to reach the top of Big Ben. And that's just one year of sampling every three months, one day. So four sampling trips. It's a tiny amount of plastic compared to how much is actually in the river. And some of this is really long lived. And that's why plastic is such a big problem. It's durable and it's hard to break up. So these are two crisp packets, both of which are 30 years old. <coughs> Sorry. And you can see that both of these are pretty much intact. Okay, the hula hoops packet is about 60% intact. But this Walker's cheese and onion packet, you could easily imagine finding something that intact being made today. And it's because of this long longevity that plastics are a problem. They do fracture, and that's where I'm interested in, in these microplastics. Not so much the big plastics, though we still monitor those. It's these fragments that are less than five millimeters. This is really easy to imagine, just anything smaller than a grain of rice, so really tiny pieces of plastic that can, in fact, go down to nanoscale. 
There are a great diversity of shapes and colours, including fibres, fragments, films, beads and nurdles, the production pellets that all plastic starts life off as. These images at the bottom were provided by Daniela Hodgson, a PhD student at Royal Holloway, but it just shows the diversity of plastic she finds in just one water sample, in just one fish, and even in the seaweed that's in the, the ocean. So this is the air bladder of a seaweed. It had a small rip in it, but she could hear something rattling in it, and she wondered what it was. And basically the current, the tide, had pushed all the plastic in and it couldn't get back out. So it was this huge hot spot for plastic, which will have an impact on grazers. The reason I'm interested in microplastics is that they're eaten by a wider range of animals. Because of their small size, they're really easy to mistake or to not even see and to accidentally ingest. Hundreds of species have had, had been evidenced to eat microplastics, but this is just a small sort of proportion of how many probably are. It's really hard to study some species, and so even though we know hundreds do, it's probably more species than that. This is a sort of simplified version of the Thames food web with some of the key species that we are studying. Today I'm going to talk about the crabs and some of the marine mammals, but not necessarily the marine mammals you'd expect to find in the Thames. <coughs> so we know that both the smallest animals on the planet and the biggest animals on the planet are affected by plastics. This is a copepod, a planktonic crustacean, and researchers at Plymouth fed it fluorescently labelled microbeads, which you can see not only does it eat, but they accumulate in the digestive tract. And then on the right is a whale. This is one of the recently stranded Thames whales, and it was uh, performed a necropsy by the Cetacean Stranding Investigation Programme at ZSL, and we were fortunate enough to do some work on some of these whales that have stranded, but I'll get back to that at the end of my talk. So plastic ingestion is a problem in itself, but it also has many knock-on effects. It can irritate and scratch the digestive system. It can cause uh, blockages, so similar to the albatross, where its stomach was full of large plastic, smaller animals can have stomachs full of micro debris. And this fullness can mean that they don't feel like feeding, and therefore they can starve. Plastic also contains chemicals, plasticizers, dyes, and flame retardants. <coughs> <coughs> and it absorbs chemicals from the environment. These can be carcinogenic or endocrine disruptors and have really severe effects on the animal's health. Large plastic can move invasive species from one area to another, and similarly, microplastics can do the same for bacteria. Once ingested, a fish or a crab might be exposed to a pathogen that they have no defence for. All in all, the animals are healing all this damage. It means more energy healing and less energy growing or reproducing. So how do I find microplastics? It all starts with finding the animals. So for most of these, it's trawling. We tow a net once every three months to get seasonal variations in plastic abundance and species abundance. And we record what animals we catch, what plastic we catch. And we've Plan to do this for two years. We've done five of our eight trips so far. But you can see that it's not only you know, the fish we're catching, but here a tyre. And just to say that large items like tyres and driftwood aren't included in the figure that I presented for the 70% of Palace of Westminster. That's just things like food packaging. Oddly, a pair of tights. Um, but you know, tyres and things which are sort of not strictly plastic necessarily aren't included in that figure. So some of the animals that we look at are the fish. So we look at both midwater and bottom-dwelling fish. So sole and flounder are the two flatfish. Pouting, whiting, and smelt, good examples of midwater species. And here you can see two, uh, well, a few mitten crabs. So these are the crustaceans we look at. We also look at native species, shrimp, and as well as uh, benthic invertebrates as well. Uh, they're quite aggressive, so um, not always the easiest to sample. The next step is dissection. So this would be removing the organs that we deem uh, affected or potentially affected. So for the seal here, it's the entire digestive uh, tract, but for the crabs and the fish, it also includes the gills. For all of the samples we collect, we don't want to waste any of the animal. 
So here you can see that rather than just cutting it open, we're very meticulously skinning and removing the blubber. And that's because the team at the museum are looking at its anatomy, its evolution. In fact, Anne Claire, who's just at the back here, she's taking each muscle and weighing it individually. So going far more in depth into this animal than I ever will. But we do the same for the fish. If anybody needs any of the organs, we give them to those teams. So really, as much of these animals is used as possible. The next step is a digestion. We use potassium hydroxide, which is a base. We dilute it to 10%, and this removes a lot of the organic material. So obviously, if you've got the entire digestive tract of a seal, it would be weeks just to search it by eye. So we really need to cut that material down. And this turns these tubes of dark liquid into these practically empty uh, filters you can see here. So the filters at the bottom of the screen, these are for the stomach contents of fish. The digestive lining, most of the food is gone and left a fairly clear filter. And then the one above, which has this sort of creamy material, that's from the gills, and it's just the gill arches that are left. So all of the tissue is, is really digested, and it makes it much easier to isolate plastics. So the next step is searching for the plastics, and that is where it takes outwards. This is by far the longest part of the process. Very simply, under a microscope, looking for anything that looks like plastic. You get a good idea once you've sort of done it enough. Typically, it's things that are uniform in shape, very vibrant colours, um, have a bit of plasticity to them. So these are gills that I'm searching, similar to the ones on the previous slide. And this is Danny searching plastics from her water samples, setting it aside for analysis. So we don't want to just assume plastic is plastic by the way it looks. Uh, often it is easy to see, but sometimes it can be deceptive. So we want to chemically prove that these materials are what we think they are. And for that, we use a technique called Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Very simply, it's a beam of light and the material you put under it absorbs that at different wavelengths by different amounts. And you can compare it to a library of materials you know. So this is um, a sort of output you'd expect to see. The blue line is a red fibre from one of the flounder we looked at. And the black line is from the library. It's for polyethylene terephthalate, or PET. It's one of the most commonly produced plastics. And you can see that these peaks match at very similar locations. And so we can pretty certainly say this is plastic, if not specifically PET. The last thing on my methods is controls for contamination. The problem with plastic is that it's everywhere, and that makes studying plastics really difficult. In this room, I have no doubt we're surrounded by plastic right now, in the air, in our clothes, on the floor. And so we have to be very careful in the lab to make sure we don't monitor any of the stuff that we've sort of brought into the system rather than what was there initially. This mostly just consists of making sure you wear cotton, having a cotton lab coat, working in a clean air environment, so a laminar flow hood or a positive pressure room, but also monitoring contamination from your techniques. So we have procedural blanks that monitor whether falcon tubes, for instance, are releasing plastic every time you screw the lid on, and we measure, uh, measure with an open petri dish what could have fallen on our samples. So the values that I'm going to present today are controlled for contamination, so it is taking all of this that we would find in the lab into account. So the first group of animals I'm going to talk about are the crabs. And initially, they were a sort of minor point of the study. It was meant to be fish in the fish food web. But the crabs have just been so interesting that I just have to study them and share their results. We're looking at two species, the native shore crab and the invasive Chinese mitten crab, which is so called because it has the furry claws. I tend to think of them as like little cheerleaders, but they're much more aggressive than any cheerleader I've ever met. So <laughs> with the crabs, as I said, we look at the digestive tract as well as the gills. But they've also got a very specialized stomach. So unlike the fish, where we just took the whole digestive tract, we split the gastric mill away from the rest of the gastrointestinal tract. And we've looked at them separately to see whether they have uh, different accumulations of plastic. So crabs can't chew, so their stomach has to do it for them. So they've got these teeth-like structures in the stomach called ossicles, and it basically breaks up and grinds their food. So there's evidence that in mangosteen, this can cause big tangles of plastic to form. But equally, there's been proposals that with shore crabs, it could shred plastic into smaller pieces 
So we wanted to see what effect it had. When we look at the free organs across the two species, you can see that almost all of the crabs in both species had plastic in at least one of the organs, if not more. But what is really interesting is when you do look at the stomach, there's a huge difference between the two. 11% of the shore crabs had tangles of plastic, as we expected, in their stomach, but 95% of the mitten crabs did. Now, we're not 100% sure what this difference is. It could be seasonal. We tend to find that if you catch one, you don't catch much of the other, and in part, that would be expected. If you've got an invasive, aggressive species, you wouldn't expect to find many natives. So we kind of get one and then the other. So it could be that we're getting a seasonal difference or slightly different stages of the life cycle. So these plastics look a bit like this. You can see hundreds of fibers tangled very densely. These can completely fill the stomach, but they also trap other pieces of plastic. So it's not just fibers, it's mostly fibers, but also here, a piece of balloon. At the back of this tangle, there's a piece of plastic bin bag. They've caught sanitary products, they've caught elastic bands, there's all sorts that these crabs are eating. By far more diverse than anything we're finding in the fish. Not all the stomachs are so full, not all of them are completely densely packed. Here you can see a fairly empty stomach. In this photo at the top you can see a white film and a sort of clear fibre highlighted with these arrows. So a fairly empty stomach, but what's particularly interesting is not how little plastic it is, but what plastic it is. So if we look under a microscope, you can see a checked pattern here, and that's something that Danny is finding in her samples from Scotland. It's something that I find in the fish from the Thames as well. And we know that this means it's a sanitary pad. So this is, a, at the top here, a sanitary pad that came from one of our nets in the Thames more recently. And at the bottom, this is just one day sampling from the previous study published in 2014. Up to 20% of the litter in the bottom of the Thames is sanitary pads and wet wipes. So flushed debris, things that have gone down the toilet that shouldn't be, are actually a really huge proportion of plastic pollution. And this is some of the first evidence that it actually impacts wildlife. So when we do the analysis to see what these materials are, we get a graph that looks a bit like this. You can see that most of these items are plastic or semi-synthetic. So the two semi-synthetic compounds are viscose and cellophane. And the reason that these are semi-synthetic and not organic or plastic is that they started life as bamboo or wood pulp, but were chemically treated. So they're no longer organic, but they're technically not completely artificial. They're uh, proposed to be some of the most abundant materials in the environment, but until recently weren't studied because they were a cellulose-based fibre, so they've been ignored. So we don't truly understand the effect of these fibres, but we know that viscose, for instance, is a rayon. It's a, uh, used for synthetic silk. It's used in sanitary products. So it is definitely used in conjunction with plastics and therefore could have similar effects. The most common, uh, clearly synthetic uh, polymers are polypropylene, polyester and polyamide, or nylon. And these can be used mostly in clothing. The textiles industry is a huge portion of the fibres we're finding, but also ropes, carpets, even in cement. Um, not likely to be shedding into the Thames, but it does go to show that plastic is used in absolutely everything around us. Uh, and then with nylon, it's obviously used in nylons, so stockings, uh, and also in toothbrush bristles, which is a thing I hadn't thought about. Every time you brush your teeth, tiny fragments must be going straight down the drain. So uh, another interesting way that we're contaminating everything, really. So what's interesting is that some of these crabs have stomachs completely full of plastic. This is a uh, dissection of a uh, mitten crab stomach. It's not completely full, but it is considerably full, and so we want to know whether this is having an impact on their health. We've not seen a decline in the mitten crab population. How great would it be if plastics controlled a pest? I mean, it, what a positive spin, but we haven't seen such a decline. So we're starting to expect that perhaps, whilst it is bad, it's not there forever. We know that crabs molt because of their exoskeletons. They don't grow the same way we do. So roughly once a year, an adult crab will shed its exoskeleton. And there's evidence that this sort of hard casing that is on this stomach is also shed in these two species. So when that stomach lining is shed, is the plastic trapped inside and they sort of start from scratch? And could this be the reason we've seen such a big difference in the two species? Did one recently molt and we just not know? 
So for the second group of animals I'm going to talk about, as I said, it was the marine mammals, but it's not the porpoises, the dolphins and the seals that are native and living there. It's actually some of the uh, unfortunate visitors for the Thames. It's been a very busy year in a bit for whales. It all started obviously with Benny the Beluga at Gravesend. He fortunately left, but some of the less fortunate uh, whale visitors to the Thames were uh, a minke whale, a battersea, a say whale and a humpback at Erif, so right on our sampling site. And also very recently, last week in fact, a sperm whale in the swale. So we will be analysing uh, stomach contents or baleen plates from all of these animals. But so far we've only got results for two, which is the say whale and the humpback. Also interestingly, there was a leatherback turtle that stranded not quite in the Thames, but if we stretch the, the definition of the Thames estuary area, we get to include this turtle in our study as well. So we will be looking at the stomach contents of this. We do know that it had large pieces of rope in its stomach, but we'll be interested in the microplastics. So most of the whales that are stranded in the Thames recently have been baleen whales. So they're filter, fe uh, filter feeders, filtering for krill, so not likely to be feeding in the Thames, but still potentially trapping plastics in the bristles of their mouth, really. So we wanted to see whether the contamination, not necessarily from the Thames, but just that these animals were exposed to, was recorded in their mouth parts. So we filtered, uh, rinsed water, sorry, and filtered that, fil uh, that rinse, and then afterwards searched the sort of bristles of the plate to see if anything was trapped and hadn't been dislodged. We had about two litres per baleen plate, um, so quite a long process to filter all of that. The filters came back quite muddy, as you'd expect from animals that are stranded on a mud flat. We got six to ten plates per animal. Um, that's a small portion of how many these animals would actually have in their mouth. Unfortunately, when you ask somebody, can you count hundreds of plates, they tend to turn around and go, no. <laughs> so we've only got an estimate of anywhere from 220 to 400 and something. So we've got quite a wide range of guesses for how many they could have. But what we know is that, yes, these animals are contaminated by plastics, that it's mostly fibres, which makes sense to be the things that would trap in the bristles of their baleen plates, and it's mostly black, which is similar to what we're finding in the environment, so no big surprise. What is shocking is that when we do estimate up, you've got anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 fibres just in the mouth, let alone what gets into the stomach and what these animals are eating. But the chemical load of these plastics could be huge. I mean, we can't say whether this is something that happened during normal feeding. Obviously, these animals did die and wash up onto muddy shores, so potentially some of this contamination could have been sort of after the animal stranded. But it is, unfortunately, the only way we can get evidence for these sorts of species. So now that I've sort of depressed you all with how much plastic is in these animals, I thought I'd sort of go with where it's coming from and some of the small changes we can make that have a really big impact. Unfortunately, plastic comes from pretty much everywhere. So I've had to add sorry onto this graphic because I didn't feel it accurately represented all of the ways that we pollute rivers. There's obviously industry and mismanaged waste, littering, uh, waste at sea, lost fishing gear, abandoned fishing gear even, but also there's household waste. So things that are flushed down the toilet is a really big thing, as I mentioned, sanitary products, wet wipes, cotton buds, but also things that we're washing in our washing machines. Most of our clothes are synthetic. Synthetic clothing is incredibly abundant, and an average wash can release 700,000 fibres at a time. Estimates, depending on the material and the product you're washing, can go as high as 13 million fibres per wash. It really, we don't know at the moment whether it's acrylic versus polyester or whether it's the way that they're specifically woven and made. So it's something we're still trying to understand, but obviously this is a huge source of contamination. We know that wastewater treatment plants will get 99% of this and filter it out, but 1% per household per wash just quickly adds up. So the easiest way to reduce our plastic waste is just to reduce the amount of plastic we use. If you can refuse it, if you can say, I don't want to use plastic cutlery or I don't want your plastic bottle, that is obviously one less item that would get into the environment. But it's not all avoidable. So if we can reuse the stuff that we do get, 
whether somebody says that's a single-use carrier bag, reuse it until you can no longer do so. If you've got something that's plastic, instead of disposing it, can you reuse it? Can you repair it before you get to that sort of disposal point? The next step would be recycling. Often people's first thought of what we should do to combat plastic pollution is by far the least effective. We shouldn't be jumping to recycling. Technology isn't there, and it's much easier to just not use it. We do, if we can't recycle it, if it's not recycled by your council, the next would be to dispose of it in one of two ways. Preferably in a way that you recover some of the energy that was trapped in that product. Most household waste is incinerated, so you would get some of that trapped energy back. But the other way would just be to dispose of it to landfill. And obviously this is the least preferable way, hence it's highlighted in red. We'd rather not send stuff to a hole in the ground. Um, equally, it's to dispose of it responsibly. There's a lot of people that would say they don't litter, but do something we call accidental littering. We've probably all done something like this. You're walking to work with your coffee cup and the bin's a bit full, so you think, I put it next to it or on top of it, and when they clean the bin, they'll take it away, they'll see it. But it really doesn't take much for that sort of well-placed, well-meaning gesture to suddenly cause your coffee cup to become litter. So, as I said, um, sanitary products and wet wipes are a huge contaminant in the Thames. You've probably heard of fatbergs that clog sewer systems. Well, there's also sort of fat reefs, these wet wipe reefs in Hammersmith, for instance, that have completely changed the shape of the river. In just a couple of hours, volunteers from Thames 21 picked up 23,000 wet wipes, and it had grown by a metre in height in a year. They were only looking at the top few centimetres, so that entire bank is artificial. You'd look at it and go, it just looks like a muddy shore, but all it takes is to bend down and just notice that actually you're standing on a pile of somebody's used wet wipes. So we say the easiest way to sort of stop this is to only flush the three Ps. Pee, poo and paper. Anything else shouldn't really go down your toilet. It doesn't matter if it says it's flushable, because that just means it won't block your toilet. It doesn't mean that it's a good idea. Technically, you could flush a pen. That wouldn't make it smart. <laughs> and then it, the new thing is whether it says it's compostable or biodegradable. Obviously, that's a company's way of saying, look, we care about the environment. But it almost certainly isn't biodegradable or compostable in wastewater treatment systems or in the environment. Under specific conditions, it probably would decompose, but whether that's in a timely manner or whether that's, you know, in a lab that's heated, I mean, compostable generally means it has to be heated to a certain temperature, and the river is really cold, so be careful when you buy a product. Just because it says it's biodegradable doesn't mean it's better for the planet. In fact, uh, Plymouth did a study where they put biodegradable bags in the ocean for the duration of somebody's PhD, buried a few more, and every single bag they dug up and took out of the ocean could still carry a full load of shopping. So three years isn't enough to biodegrade, so I doubt flushing something down the toilet will fix that problem. Thames uh, Water have some suggestions for reusable wet wipe alternatives. Uh, things like cotton pads, if you are using it to wipe your bum, they're sort of cleansing foams you can use for tissue paper. Um, but sanitary products are another thing that's flushed down the toilet, so there are a few reusable alternatives if you use sanitary pads or tampons as well. And then lastly, I thought I'd end on the washing machine, the sort of daunting thing. We can't all swap to cotton because that would equally be quite bad. The water use, the land use would have implications for climate change. So by no means am I saying we should all stop using plastic. But when we do use plastic, we should consider where we get it from and how we wash it. If you wear it, does it need to be washed a second, uh, washed immediately, or is it clean? Can you wear it again? I'm not suggesting that we all go smelling of bo and never wash our clothes, but you know, it's very easy to wash or to wear it and just chuck it in the the hamper and not think actually that's probably still clean. If you're buying clothes, buy second hand. That means there's less fibres being produced. Equally, if you're trying to get rid of your clothes, donate them to charity, sell them, give them to a friend. They don't need to just sort of be disposed of. They can still be used, even if they have a hole in, use them for a rag. And then the last thing I've got is filters for washing machines. So Dyson, I think, produce an external filter for your washing machine. Um, to me, that sounds like a bit of a hassle, having to actually install something. 
but uh, there's this product called Guppy Friend Bag. It's 99% efficient, so it seems like a pretty good product to me. You just put all your clothes into this bag. It's got a very fine mesh, and it traps most of the fibers. Very simply, you just pull those fibers out, put them in your household waste, and they're incinerated. So not necessarily a solution to the problem, but in the time, it's a, a, obviously a really good way of reducing that 1% that gets out into the ocean. So I thought I'd end by thanking everybody that's helped me with my project, so my supervisors, everybody that's helped in the lab work, and everybody that's helped with sampling and funding, and lastly, everybody for listening. <laughs>